I want choices and rights. The whole issue of bringing disability quality training into education, in honesty, started because I became a parent of a disabled child and um, I had never been in a mainstream school my, in my life until I went into the primary school I wanted my daughter to go to and um, realised they hadn't heard a word of any of this stuff. I was going backwards in time, trying to talk to them about, you know, including my daughter. And it was like, they don't come to us. We don't have disabled children in our school. It's not an issue here. Really. And it suddenly dawned on me we were going to have to bring this work mm. back. Reluctant though I was, but I was kind of feeling I couldn't expect Lucy to be in a mainstream school, or any child, if we weren't willing to do the work with our schools to make it a place they want to be. It was at the time that Ilya was being murdered by Margaret Thatcher. They were anxious to leave behind some sort of good practice model in all the London boroughs on many issues and they included disability in that, mm. which was in itself quite a forward-thinking issue. Um, Richard <laughs> at that time was a disgruntled disabled teacher working with the trade union and wasn't an inclusion, wasn't, didn't really support the notion of inclusive education because he was seeing it as a view from the viewpoint of teachers having the right to exclude. But I'd also, in my own struggle as a parent, met other parents of disabled young people. Um, and I also had the same realisation that parents need this training as well as teachers and so on. And through that had a few really strong allies amongst the parents. They suggested I was one of the people that was interviewed or was given this money to do something useful and Richard was put out by the other camp who thought they would make, he would bring reason to the whole thing and make me realise the errors of my way. Yes. That was how it was. We were forced together by two warring factions of parents. We met in this room. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember many long conversations we had where I had to really reevaluate all of the things that I'd thought about including uh, disabled kids or integrating them and uh, disability itself and it began to challenge my own thinking about being a disabled person. I had polio when I was nine months old and really I had passed in the mainstream, with some exceptions, but nevertheless, uh, and as a teacher, although I'd actually ended up being an advisor for writing some material for the ILEA because they'd moved me from my school because of my disability, I hadn't, re I had fought it as a grievance, but that was so. I was looking at disability in the curriculum, and I had been for a couple of years before the inspector of SEN put me forward to, to be the other side of writing this guidance. But what really struck me was I hadn't really understood the social model at all. It was liberating in the sense of understanding that I wasn't the problem, society was. And once I got that, it was then about looking at education and saying, well, we have to remove all the barriers in education and I became a convinced inclusionist in about three months of arguing with Michelin. There were arguments we had, because I had to test out every idea I had to prove it was useless before I could go on and challenge everything from the other side. So it was quite amazing, and the net result was this book, which came out of our arguments, which was meant to be a pamphlet, but as you can see, it's quite thick, 260 pages, uh, which came out of, as a guide for schools, disability equality in the classroom, a human rights issue, 
was really the first book in the world that actually brought the social model into education mm. and uh, was really um, very innovative. And of course the ILEA disappeared on the 31st of March 1990 and they had three and a half thousand of these books left and so they didn't know what to do with them so they sent them across to me which had, I'd been redeployed into Hackney uh, and I found an old toilet block at the teachers centre where they sat in boxes and employed some people part time to distribute them around the country and the world and there was a big demand for it because this was a new perspective and then it became very clear that just putting the book out there wasn't enough that we had to develop disability equality training such as we uh, was developed by the London boroughs but specifically for education and we tried for a long time to get funding for that mm. uh, I set up an organization called disability equality in education to, to do that and it took five years till Comet Relief changed their rules before we could actually get any funding and then Michelin and me organized the materials and we held some training the trainer events uh, in uh, in the late 90s and prior to that we'd been funded by Comet Relief to get some trainers together around a book called All Together Better which came after this mm. <coughs> But really, the political wing of all of this work was the setting up the Alliance for Integration, as it was called then. And it was Michelin's perspective of bringing in parents as allies, teachers as allies, disabled <coughs> teachers, disabled young people, professionals, psychologists and others who supported integration that led to the Alliance. Having thought, having made very close connections with a few parents that were mm. quite radical. It was a very, you know, luck is a lot to play with these things, isn't it? Mm. The people that wash up on your doorstep. Joe Cameron, Diana Simpson, Margaret Gort. They were very unusual and they were all quite radical thinkers and all had parents, children with quite severe learning difficulties, which again was a bit of a learning curve for me. Mm. That was the place I was challenged. I felt that the parents needed the support of other people like me, other disabled mm. people, many of whom had been to special school, who, who would give the parents the confidence to carry this fight on, knowing that they had done the right thing, because they were fighting for babies and young children who weren't going to give them that reassurance, mm. but we as adults could give it to them. So the first workshop we called together, I can't remember its name now, was the parents and disabled activists and leaders and a few professionals, such as Mark Ford and CSIE, which also existed mm. at that time, and a few rather radical educational psychologists. A few allies came, but the main thing was this mixing of parents with disabled adults. Um, and coming together as a united front. Parents had their own organisation that was called Parents' Campaign for Integrated Education. Disabled people didn't have an organisation at all and that felt very wrong to me and I knew it had to be separate. It had to be led by disabled people. The weird thing is about the whole thing about special education is that nobody ever asked the people that have been through it what they thought about it, or what the result of it was, or how we could improve it for whether this was a practice that should go on. It was always seen as a parent's choice. And um, that's when we thought of setting up the Alliance for Inclusive Education, which was a disabled people's led organisation to whom allies were invited or could join but it was led by disabled people and that was in the constitution and it was very fixed. And just before I got involved with Michelin I was looking at disability issues and I was particularly interested in how disabled teachers were being treated and I wrote several articles in the national press about this uh, discrimination that was taking place and in 1989 at Easter I moved successfully a motion through the NUT annual conference that there should be a working group set up to bring equality for disabled teachers 
And that was, if you like, the first step in beginning to challenge the idea of the thinking about disabled people at, at the conference. And because of my links with Michelin from September 89 onwards, I was then involved in this conference setting up uh, the Integration Alliance. And I think I, I became the chair and uh, you became the secretary. Uh, and it was set up in such a way there were lots of different groups in the constitution uh, but the numbers that had to be filled didn't matter who was at the meeting there had to be a majority of disabled people whether they were young people uh, survivors of uh, institutional care uh, disabled teachers but there was also spaces for allies professionals parents and so on, and teachers but that was the idea, that it was a bringing together. And this clashed very strongly with most of the disability movement at that time, were striving to have 100% control of their organisations mm. as a sort of defence mechanism to never being listened to, really. Yeah. And I suppose that was what, one of the unique things about the Alliance, is that it had all those views in, but it was led by disabled people, and that then mark the question, well if we, it's going to be led in this way then we also have to have training led by disabled people. The Alliance, I think in the time that Michelin and I were involved in it, did achieve a number of things well above its weight in terms of uh, moving things forward. One of the early things was to produce our own draft bill that went to Parliament. Yeah. A solicitor, David Rubain, wrote it out in legalese for us. But it was basically that there'd be an absolute right to inclusive education. And at the time, there were three caveats that stopped disabled children going to mainstream school. The 1981 Act said there is a right to mainstream education, but only if uh, you um, didn't cost too much, that the mainstream school could give you an appropriate education and you didn't interfere with the efficient education of other children, which in most local authorities meant that any child with a more significant impairment never got to school. So we set about not only having that bill as a propaganda exercise, but actually after 97, when the Labour government came in, we actually worked quite hard to get them to change the law to get rid of those caveats. And we did actually get two of them taken out. We did, yes. Which was a great success, really, for a small organisation. It was very interesting that we used the same technique, if you like, of training, of always mm. trying to win people over by um, rational argument, if you like, mm. never blaming them, never, you know, doing the war thing, but always assuming they just didn't know, they hadn't heard mm. the other side, which most of them hadn't. And once, I think that was our thing. The other thing that happened, actually was important, was the Canadian model mm. of, of, inclus of inclusive education that was brought here by CSIE, who mm. brought George Flynn over, and he spoke about what they'd done in his school board in Canada, where they'd made this decision to not segregate anymore, and to bring those children into the heart of the community. And it was so moving, and it was so um, forward thinking compared to what mm. we were doing. And he talked about inclusion being an, something everybody wants, that it was, it was for everybody's benefit, not just the be benefit of a disabled child. And with that, we actually changed the language. We changed the word from integrated education to inclusive education. And that was a bit of a shift as well, wasn't it? Absolutely. Because that kind of also meant that it was about it wasn't about integrating disabled children into mainstream, unchanged mainstream schools with a few props. Mm. But it was about really a re-evaluation of what school is about. It was a much more fundamental... It was a, it was a fundamental restructuring of yeah, schools. Yeah. That you had to change the curriculum, the way you taught it, the way you assessed it how different children related to each other, that there was peer support, yeah. that the children themselves actually challenged other children who used disabledist and racist language, yeah. uh, that there was a whole school approach and that the teachers bought into this and that the young people 
were very much part of it with the school councils and so on. And there were a number of schools that did start running like that. Absolutely, some amazing, it allowed some really forward thinking people, leaders mm. within schools mm. to create a different model. Mm. And, um, and they did it. And I, again, the confidence within the teaching mm. world has risen enormously because of those actual models mm. of good practice mm. that were, were put out there. It's never been perfect. It's, a, it's still a journey mm. with, you know, an ending somewhere else. But um, they found it was possible. And once you find it's possible in one school, it's very difficult to argue mm. that it couldn't be rationally possible in every school. Mm. When uh, Labour was about to be elected in 1997, we four of us went and met with David Blunkett to actually get an assurance that if Labour won, that they would implement inclusive education, and he promised us that they would. And they did make some steps towards that. They had a, a green paper and then an action plan which were moving them on, saying things such as, if a school has never taken this type of child this, with this type of impairment before, that doesn't mean they shouldn't take them. There were actual grants for training, and so we uh, got some money on that. And as the Alliance was just a campaigning organisation, Disability Equality and Education, which I was running as a charity, got money from the government to train trainers, and we trained about 600 disabled people okay. to, to do this. And as a result of that, we trained 150,000 educationists, which was amazing, given uh, how small we were. We had a course book, they all got the course book, how to do it. Uh, and that got evaluated, and it did show that about 60 to 70 percent of schools and those who participated really changed their attitudes and practice. So it did work. Uh, and if it had had more support and lasted for longer, we wouldn't be back where we are now yeah. with the clock being turned back. And the other thing that we did from that, uh, once we'd sorted out in our own minds the difference between integration, inclusion, exclusion, and segregation. We argued that very strongly and when the uh, United Nations was putting together the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, they were, by the fifth or sixth meeting, they were, had ended up with there should be choice. And uh, we knew that choice was not real choice and that the principle, the human rights principle, was inclusion. And so myself and I think Tara Flood and also someone from the CSIE, we were at the convention for three of the meetings and we argued this. This was the most hotly contested issue in making the convention. It went to three votes and in the end we won that the principle would be inclusive education. And then for quite a long time, state parties who meant to implement this weren't. And so then the committee of disabled people that's elected by the state parties produced in... Um, Art, um, general comment number four, there actually is a paragraph there, paragraph 13, that is based on our thinking, which actually makes the difference between inclusion, integration, segregation and exclusion. So that small discussions that we had in South London is now in world law, that is, it, it counts as a legal document, uh, and, and so that is, and everywhere I go, all around the world, people are doing little diagrams showing these four states. So it just shows that if you have clear thinking mm -hmm. that's developed, that works, it can go very much wider. And of course, that, that to implement that around the world, of course, is now the big mission, because apart from a large number of disabled kids being excluded, most of them are integrated and failing because there are no adjustments being made for them. Mm. And then they say, well, see, we told you they couldn't be educated. That is not the point. We know it works. We have to convince the rest of the world it works. And the other piece of the work that I think is very key was the work with parents. Mm -hmm. Because as well as developing all the work within schools and with mm -hmm. teachers and that, that world, the world of parents of new, you know, young, children who had never been exposed to any of this thinking, why would they, um, until they suddenly became a parent of a disabled child, where were they to go to get some support so they weren't just desperately looking for a cure or a treatment and wanting special school because that's where they thought it was, you know. And with these rather radical parents, we created the Plan of Positive Futures course and school-based support groups 
Um, and there was the third thing. They ran their helpline in a completely mm. different way. Mm. And again, we used the same model. That was always a disabled trainer with a parent ally together as a model. And we talked about that relationship as part of the training. Mm. And again, I can't remember, I don't know how many courses we ran or parents mm. we got to, it was a lot. Mm. And they became the champions of inclusion and brought up these wonderful, empowered young people. And that generation are now out in the world taking up the, the, the fight for themselves, you know, Nadia and Marisa and Lucy and Anthony Ford and, you know, lots of mm. another generation. I think really. it would be true to say we weren't the only ones pushing for this. People had taken the 1981 Act seriously. For instance, Linda Jordan and Chris Goody in, in Newham had said, well, it says all children should be able to go to school. They had a daughter with Down syndrome. She went to a mainstream nursery. Then, as it was in Newham, they said, well, now she has to go to the special school. And they said, why? Why can't she just go on with her peers? And so they, Chris became a chair of governors and Linda ran for the council and became chair of education and they brought in a, a structural change model for the, yeah. all the schools in Newham to become inclusive. That's true. And uh, there was some resistance from parents so they made some resource bases in the schools for the expertise that they were closing but by and large children went to their local school and the whole range of children went there. Even now, 30 plus years on, it still has by far the lowest level of segregation in any local authority out of the 150 in England. So that is still there as a legacy, but of course it's being attacked by the uh, neoconservative ideas of the government, of the free market coming into special schools and so on, just as it is everywhere else. Uh, but nevertheless, we need to recognise that that and a number of other professionals right across the, the social services, educational psychology, as well as teachers, really embraced this and took it on to such an extent that Ofsted, when they did an inspection of schools about the best provision for education in 2005, said by far the best provision is resource base in a mainstream school, better than a special school and better than just piecemeal integration. Uh, and that still remains the case, yet you wouldn't know that because the government today is busy building lots of sp free special schools, which is not the answer, because they have made it impossible for many schools to operate good inclusion by restricting the curriculum, le uh, league table that's pushing results up and cutting year after year what has been described recently as the mortar of inclusion, the teaching assistants who make it possible. Mm -hmm. So once you take all those things away, it is extremely difficult for a mainstream school to take the whole variety of children. But those are barriers that the government themselves have created and they could equally be taken away and within five or ten years we could be back to a really inclusive system. I think, I, ho I hope in a way, that I'm right about this. If you pair what we are doing right down to the values mm -hmm. beneath it, we were extremely challenging to the status quo, if you like, to the power of wealth mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. I think people like David Cameron knew it. Mm -hmm. I think that's why they created this, let's reverse this mm -hmm. dreadful trend <laughs> mm -hmm. and go back to deep competition and the survival of the fittest because how else are we going to stay on top?